Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the Mid-Atlantic Council April meeting. Let's get started with our first agenda item, the Joint Mid-Atlantic Council New England Fishing Council Framework to Reduce Atlantic Sturgeon Interactions in the Monkfish, Dogfish, Gillnet Fisheries. This will be our final action. Carson, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Great, thank you. And sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Uh, my four and a half month old told me that I couldn't come. And um, as the chairman mentioned, um, this is the final action for this framework. And as you all saw in February, there, there was um, more work done by the Mid-Atlantic Council. So I wanna thank Jason Din for filling in for me uh, while I was out on maternity leave. So it's really been a team effort as well as with New England staff. So I just wanted to give all of them a shout out. Next slide, please. So this is just an outline of the meeting today. First, I'm going to review um, all of the alternatives in the framework document, as well as the draft impacts analyses. Um, and then we have FMAT and PDT recommendations, AP recommendations and committee recommendations for final action alternatives. And then after that, we'll move on to the decision point, which is final action, selecting the preferred alternatives for spiny dogfish as well as for monkfish. Next slide, please. So the 2021 biological opinion that resulted in the action plan is still active, um, as this group has heard, and it stated that Atlantic sturgeon bycatch must be reduced in federal large mesh gillnet fisheries by 2024. So that's been the basis for this action so far. And then as has been discussed as well, there's a new biological opinion under development um, and the sturgeon takes exceeded the 2021 biological opinions incidental take statement. In addition to that, sturgeon bycatch mortality has also increased in recent New England takes next week um, to determine if other measures are necessary. Um, and then if there is more anticipated reduction now, um, there may be less chance for a jeopardy finding in that uh, new biop and less chance of more stringent measures in the future. Um, a a follow-up action may or may not be council-led. It could be NIMS-led as well. Next slide, please. So just a very big, broad overview of the alternatives. Um, the, they'll be in more detail later, but this slide just shows that there are four alternative packages along with a no action alternative. And alternatives two through four include time area closures uh, as well as time area gear restrictions. And alternative two is the most restrictive um, with uh, for being the least restrictive. And then alternative five does not include closures. Um, it only has gear restrictions uh, for both monkfish and dogfish. And so this is a broad overview of the impacts. Um, the analysis showed that the time area closures were actually not as effective as was anticipated because of shifting effort and more spread out um, sturgeon risk than previously thought. And then the amount of gear that would be removed or displaced appeared low coast wide, but um, maybe high on a regional basis for those uh, time area closures. And then lastly, <clears throat> the cost to industry from a gear restriction or changing gear could be substantial, um, but gear modifications allow for more flexibility for industry to adapt practices as well as keep fishing um, instead of closures. Next slide, please. So this slide reviews the Atlantic sturgeon population status. And as you may recall, there are five distinct population segments and four of them are listed as endangered. And so the only one that's not endangered is the Gulf of Maine DPS, which has a threatened status. Um, and then the results of the 2017 sturgeon assessment 
that was conducted by ASMFC said that sturgeon is depleted coast wide um, with a slight positive trend since the 1998 moratorium. And so the next assessment is happening this year and it's an assessment update. So there'll be new years of data added, um, but there won't be a peer review or changes to the model, uh, an external peer review. And so this spring, the assessment subcommittee and technical committee meetings um, associated with this, uh, this assessment are open to the public. Um, in May, the technical committee will review the draft report and by mid July, the assessment report will be publicly available. Um, and then at the August ASMFC board meeting is when those results will be discussed. Next slide, please. So, um, since the, the recent um, sturgeon bycatch did exceed the incidental take statement, NIMS is conducting that new biological opinion. And so we can expect that in January of 2025. Um, and as I mentioned before, it may trigger uh, the need for more bycatch reduction, but it will consider whatever action is taken today. And then there, um, there may be the chance to incorporate research results and other information. So there is testing of low profile gear in other regions than just New Jersey, um, which may provide more options in the future. Next slide, please. So the sturgeon alternative alternatives are in packages and um, this slide just reviews each one and on the right hand side you can see a map of the hotspot polygons and so from north to south um, the most northern polygon is southern new england and would apply to monkfish and then the new jersey polygon is um, shaded in purple and that applies to monkfish and dogfish and then as you move further south, the um, Delmarva and uh, further south Virginia uh, polygons would apply to spiny dogfish only. And so those are all the regions that we're talking about whenever we talk about area closures or gear restrictions. So under alternative two, the higher impacts alternative, there would be time area closures and gear restriction me measures. Alternative three is intermediate, so it's a subset of alternative two. Alternative four is lower impacts, so an even further subset of alternative two. And then alternative five is only um, gear restriction measures. And then there are sub alternatives for alternative five that were added uh, by the Mid-Atlantic in February. And those are um, a smaller mesh exemption from the overnight soak prohibition. So for vessels using less than five and a quarter inch mesh, and we'll get into that in more detail later as well. Next slide, please. So alternative one is no action. This is um, this would be a violation of the Endangered Species Act because it wouldn't satisfy the need to reduce sturgeon bycatch by 2024. Um, so if the councils did choose alternative one. NIMS would be in a situation where they would need to take action under their um, ESA rulemaking process. So no action doesn't necessarily mean no measures uh, would be put in place for sturgeon. And then alternative two, um, the high impact sturgeon package. So this once again has the most time area closures and gear restrictions. Um, so for the top tables on these next few slides are for monkfish, and that means federal vessels targeting monkfish in federal and state waters. And then Carson, are you still there? We've lost you. Can you hear me? Uh, we Briefly, yeah, you're back now. Okay. You need to go back just uh, 30 seconds, maybe. Okay. Um, so, for federal vessels targeting monkfish in federal and state waters, um, I'm referring to the top table here. And for the southern New England region, um, th there's a closure. That would be the type of measure. 
and that would be April and May, as well as December. And then for the New Jersey Polygon region, there would, there would be a closure from in May and then also from October 15th through December, the end of December. And then New Jersey would um, also have low profile gillnet gear required for the rest of the time that that closure is not in place. So once again, this is the most time area closures alternative. And then looking at the um, bottom table for spiny dogfish. So this would apply to federal vessels targeting spiny dogfish in federal and state waters. Um, the New Jersey Polygon would have a closure for May and then October 15th through December 31st. And then Delmarva Polygons would have a closure from November 1st through March 31st. Next slide, please. Um, alternative three is the intermediate impact sturgeon package. And on the top, we have monkfish again. So for Southern New England, there would be a closure for May and December. For New Jersey, there would be a closure for December and then low profile gear um, for the rest of the year. And then for spiny dogfish, for New Jersey, there would be a closure for November and December. And then an overnight soak prohibition from, um, just for May. And then in the Delmarva polygons, a closure um, from December through February. Next slide, please. For alternative four, the lower impact package um, with less time area closures and gear restrictions. The, for monkfish, Southern New England, there would be a closure in December. For New Jersey monkfish, there would be a closure for November and then low. We lost you again, Carson. Um, would have a closure in December and January. Next slide, please. And can you hear me okay still? Yeah, you, you're you break, breaking up every once in a while. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, let me know if uh, if I go out again and I'll I'll switch. Yeah, I think you, you may want to switch. I don't know. We got Jason warming up on the on deck circle just in case. Yeah. Yeah, she's chatting saying she thinks it's Wi Fi. Jason, you want to maybe get ready to queue up the mic?
she's going to call in. I'm going to suggest waiting 60 seconds, see if that call in works, and then I can roll. Okay. You want to go ahead and try now, Jason? Okie dokie. Um, so I'm not sh quite sure the exact words were left off, but so Carson was describing that the fifth alternative is the gear only sturgeon package. Um, and then next slide. Um, then there were the sub alternatives that allowed the exemptions and we'll touch base. I mean, you'll, you'll hear those directly um, when we get to the motions. Um, and these were really put in there due to some input that, as originally written, the, 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 the gear restrictions were, would essentially got input would end the fishery, but um, next slide. But when we looked at it by mesh category, um, it did look like the mesh, um, the five inch mesh, and that's why it was less than 5.25 inches, had lower catch rates of sturgeon. Um, the FMAT also looked at it by month to try to get a sense. Um, the FMAT, <clears throat> we didn't have this information um, kind of completed when we were meeting. Uh, the FMAT kind of left it off. It was supportive of the exemption given the lower catch rates by that smaller mesh, um, but still trying to maximize benefits for to sturgeon also said, um, you know, m maybe not have the exemption for the month with the, the the with the month with the highest sturgeon catch which unfortunately was december which is a high productivity month for virginia for dogfish next slide um and then um so we also looked at thought about this question for new jersey um there really weren't enough trips for us to kind of conclusively determine whether or not um, the same kind of thing might apply to, to New Jersey. And the council then had some discussion um, last go around. Well, I mean, if, if it's a, you know, it's, it's a gear and location and timing thing, um, you know, even if we don't have trips in New Jersey using this, if we see trips in Virginia using this, um, might that be enough for the rationale? And again, we'll touch base on that when we get to motions next. So, um, I'll just see if Carson happens to be back on on phone. Carson. So, okay, I'll keep pushing through here. Um, so we were fortunate enough to have um, an analytical tool that um, has been being used for a lot of large whales to try to figure out, you know, what might be um, the effects of some of the closures in terms of um, where gear has been, where might it go. The big picture result was that if you're kind of constraining, um, you know, if you don't constrain how far the, the catch might go, um, it, you, it doesn't look like you're re removing a lot of gear. And even if you say, okay, they can only move 20 miles, we still didn't see um, a huge change in either effort levels Coastwide, yeah, we pushed gear out of some areas, um, but the model that also looks at sturgeon risk said, yeah, you know, th these inshore areas, there's a bit higher risk there, but there's still risk when we push it and displace this effort. So we didn't really get a lot of um, much bang for the buck. The analysts kind of went and looked and, and spot checked some of the data that said, yeah, still offshore, yeah, lower, but not none. Um, and, and, and um, so we didn't get as much kind of bang for the buck as we thought we might, eliminating effort from these hot spots. Next. Um, so just this map is just kind of describing where we see current gear density for monkfish. Um, and again, we had this, um, the, 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 the team looking at this for, for whales was super helpful to try to let us visualize, 
you know, where is effort now and where might it go um, with some of these options? Next. Um, again, we had it for dogfish and monkfish and use this to, 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 to model the results of some of these closures. And, and again, the, the results um, you know, were a little surprising to us that you know, it, it didn't seem to likely to lead to a, a lot of reduced sturgeon catch, which kind of conflicts with the literature that you know, you, you, you'd expect getting effort out of these nearshore areas where the literature suggests they are. Um, but again, we still see some observations to take, so some risk further off and outside of the hotspots. Next. Carson, Hi, Mike, Jason, can you hear me? Yes. Can yes. you hear me? Oh my God, okay. Uh, I was trying to interrupt you between each one, but I guess I was still muted. Um, thank you for doing all of that presenting in between. So <clears throat> for the expected reduction from the model runs, these are expected reductions in sturgeon takes for the different closure alternatives under different fishing behaviors. So for example, looking at the first row under alternative two, um, a, a maximum dis and a maximum distance that fishermen would move their gear of 20 nautical miles. The percent reduction in sturgeon takes is 13%. And that's under the most restrictive closures. Um, and then the less restrictive closures under alternative four would reduce sturgeon takes by only about two to 4% depending on the maximum gear relocation distance. So that kind of illustrates that uh, less conservation, conservation benefit than was expected under the closure uh, option. Next slide, please. And then another concern um, throughout the development of this action is that it's important to not shift fishing effort into um, important right whale habitat or create conflicting closures. Um, so this map shows the Southern New England polygon for this action and then the South Island restricted area under the large whale pig production plan. Um, currently there are no gillnet restrictions in the South Island restricted area but there is an anticipated proposed rule to address gillnet and other trap pot fisheries risk to right whales early next year um, that this area was included in that package um, with a proposed closure. Um, so as you can see the polygon on the left is from our uh, the sturgeon framework action and then the rectangle on the right is that uh, that right whale area so um, under the underneath layer is right whale habitat and you can see that during several months there is important habitat around that polygon next slide please so for socioeconomic impacts um, Appendix D in the framework document summarizes the revenues for monkfish and spiny dogfish in various ways for 2020 through 2022. So first it summarizes the revenues coastwide um, by month and then by year, so getting into gill net revenues. And then the table, um, the tables hone in on gill net revenues in the regions of the polygons and then within the polygons themselves in order to look at impacts. Next slide, please. Um, and then these are just a couple of notes. So on the following tables, the blank areas are confidential or low revenue or landings months. And then um, just to summarize, there weren't any huge surprises in terms of where and when the impacts would occur. So high revenue and high landings um, months are also area uh, times and areas of um, sturgeon interaction. Next slide. So um, starting out with Southern New England monkfish. Uh, and so for that monkfish polygon, um, April, May, and December are considered in the alternative. And the highest revenues in this area come from June followed by May. So for the alternatives, proposed closures, um, May would have the highest negative impact followed by April and December. Next slide. In New Jersey um, for monkfish, the highest revenues in the polygon occur in December, um, which is included in two of the closure alternatives. And then the next 
highest revenue month is January, um, which is not a closure month in the alternative. Next slide. Moving on to dogfish, the highest revenue in the New Jersey Polygon for spiny dogfish occurs in November, which is included as a closure month um, in the most restrictive alternative. Next slide. And then for the Maryland, Virginia Polygon area, all of the important months for revenue are considered in the closure alternative. And so as I previously mentioned, Months of high revenue are, off, are often also high months of surgeon interactions, um, given that is when fishing effort is occurring um, throughout those polygon regions. Um, and this matches with what advisors have, have said as well. Next slide, please. So now I'll get into the FMAT, PDT, AP, and committee recommendations. Um, and I'll start with monkfish. And so we have them all on one slide for these different groups so that you can kind of see where they agreed. Um, but the FMAT and PDT met first and they met in February to make the recommendations. And then the AP and Joint Committee met um, in early and mid-March. So in Southern New England, the FMAT and PDT, AP and Committee all recommended no, no measures be put into place. And as you'll recall, this region doesn't have the low profile gear option since it hasn't been tested. Um, and it also overall wasn't as strong of a hotspot area for sturgeon takes. And then lastly, there were those concerns with shifting effort into right whale habitat with a closure. And then for New Jersey, the FMAT and PDT, AP and committee all recommended alternative five, which is year round low profile gill net gear required within the polygon region. And the AP caveat to this was that they felt that this was the way to go if there absolutely needed to be action taken. Um, overall, there were concerns from all the groups over the economic impacts of closures. So they were not recommended um, for, for either monkfish or spiny dogfish. And um, additionally, the results of the new assessment and the new biological opinion should be known before more measures are required. Next slide, please. So moving on to dogfish recommendations. In New Jersey, the FMAP PDT recommended alternative five, um, the gear only option. And in this region, they did not recommend the smaller mesh exemption because of the lack of observer data for this mesh in region, um, as noted earlier. And then at the AP meeting, some advisors felt the overnight soak prohibition was doable in New Jersey, um, while a fisherman member of the public was against this. And then the committee recommended alternative five with subalternative 5A, which is the small mesh exemption, and added that although there's a lack of observer data in the New Jersey region, the data from the Delmarva region could serve as a proxy for New Jersey. Um, so that was kind of the rationale there. And then moving on to the next region for spiny dogfish. Um, so for the Delmarva region, the FMAT and PDT once again recommended alternative five and recommended that um, they recommended a modified version of alternative 5B. So the FMAT PDT um, discussed that a small mesh exemption could be in place potentially for all the months within the alternative except for the month with the highest takes. And so um, analysis later on showed that this would be December. So there would, the exemption would not apply to December under the FMAP PDT recommendation. Um, the dogfish AP felt that the small mesh exemption should apply. Um, so alternative 5B, they noted that overnight soak prohibitions are the equivalent to a closure in this region. And they felt that um, without that uh, subalternative, um, these closures would end the fishery. And then as mentioned on the previous slide, the joint committee recommended alternative five with subalternatives 5A and 5B. So that is the five and a quarter inch or smaller mesh exemption for both dogfish regions. And they felt that closures and overnight soaks in the area seem generally problematic. So um, they overall felt that this balanced um, economic impacts and protected species impacts and they felt that that was important to, to consider as was directed by the action plan. Next slide. 
So there were also some other recommendations that weren't specific to an alternative selection. Um, the FMAP PDT noted that more research is needed to understand sturgeon bycatch and how to reduce interactions. And there's the general uncertainty about the next biological opinion and whether there will need to be additional reductions. And then there's also concern and the need to avoid shifting effort from closures to uh, right whale habitat. The uh, monkfish AP felt that managers should wait for the sturgeon assessment results before there are before making any other recommendations and in general, more research on sturgeon tagging to inform the new biological opinion and additional gear modification options should all be looked into. And for dogfish, the advisory panel noted that measures, um, that any restrictions would put people out of business. There was a general lack of support for all the alternatives um, and there was no support for closures. And once again, um, a desire to wait for the assessment results and see how the sturgeon population is doing before restrictions are put into place. And then um, further research is needed on the lighter twine sizes and ways to enforce longer soak times versus the uh, no overnight soak option. Next slide, please. So this is... Um, Another issue that came up at the, it first came up during the advisory panel meeting, and then the committee discussed the issue as well. But there um, is a scenario where a sturgeon could be caught dead in a gill net and then thrown back overboard um, without being marked in any way, and then re caught in the net, and then that could be counted as two takes. So the Monkfish and uh, Sunny Dogfish Committee jointly had a consensus, consensus statement related to this to recommend that the Mid-Atlantic and New England Councils write a letter to the Science Center Observer Program to develop and implement a carcass tagging program for dead sturgeon discards. And so there is a program already for sea turtles and marine mammals to mark um, the dead animals and then include a tagging program as well for live sturgeon discards. And the program, the programs would apply to any fishery where sturgeon are caught, regardless of gear type, area, et cetera. Um, so once again, this is to prevent the possibility of double counting um, individual observed sturgeon takes, um, since obviously improving that data set can be really helpful and have big implications for uh, management. Next slide. So this is just a reminder of the timeline we did a lot in 2023. Um, the star is where we are in 2024, April. So we're at final action for us. And then the New England Council will take final action next week. And then after that, staff will submit the framework with preferred alternatives to fishery service as soon as possible. And then the proposed rule um, will come out and is anticipated in 2024. Next slide. So the decision points today are to select the preferred alternatives for spiny dogfish and monkfish. Um, I have the committee recommendations on there, um, but I can go back to the kind of more summary slides by species as needed. And then once again, next steps are the New England Council final action um, next week on April 17th. And that's all I have. Thank you, Carson. Are there any questions for Carson? Comment for Carson? Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks. Thanks for the presentation, Carson, and, and pinch hitting by Jason. I guess one question, I apologize if I missed this, but the additional analysis that the FMAT and PDT did looking at the, um, for the, the two, um, exemptions for the five and a quarter inch mesh that we we put in last time, and the recommendation to not exempt December from the overnight soak prohibition was that was that analysis. I'm just looking at the you know the PDT the the supplemental to the PDT report. 
for those those takes per observed trip for dogfish by month, those were not sorted out by mesh less than five and a quarter and greater than five and a quarter, were they? That was just all all trips. Um Sorry, were you talking about New Jersey or um, Delmarva? Delmarva, sorry. Okay, so that um, that was by mesh. I'm trying to look for the slide number. Uh, slide 15. Jason, you have an answer. Yeah, it, it wasn't like double stratified. Um, so we did one where we looked at it by mesh, another the same grouping. Um, all by month. Um, I, I mean, I, it did occur to me maybe to stratify, but now you're really chopping things up small. Um, and I think the point was more like when or the sturgeon kind of intersecting with the fishery overall. Thank you. That was my assumption, but I just want to make sure. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? All right, we're going to be taking these actions. We're going to be splitting things up a little bit here. Uh, we're going to start off with the motion that we have from the Spiny Dogfish Committee. As this will be a committee motion, we won't be needing a second on this. And Sonny Gwynn, as chairman of the Dogfish Committee, would you read it into the minutes, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. On behalf of the committee, move to adopt alternative five with an exception for both Jersey, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, bycatch polygons for the use of gillnet mess mesh less than 5.25 inches. And Delmarva mesh 5.25 mesh could do no, could do overnight soaks year round. Mesh 5.25 couldn't not do overnight soaks from November through March. In New Jersey, in New Jersey, mesh 2.5.25 mesh could do overnight soaks year round. Mesh 2.25 could not do overnight soaks in May and November. Sounds a little complicated, but I hope everybody can understand it. On behalf of the committee. Thank you, Sonny. Any comment? I did add. Um, Go ahead, Carson. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say I did add Gwen on behalf of the committee to the document, so I don't know if we can refresh it um, or if my Wi-Fi is just being terrible. Okay, Mary says she can see it, so maybe it's just on the webinar a little delayed. But thank you. Yep, I think we're good. Thank you. Discussion on a motion. Mike Penny. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And yeah, thanks to the work of the staff and the team that put um, all this together and, and, I, and, you know, with a pretty short turnaround, given the urgency to take final action um, here today. Appreciate all the work that the staff did and the committee and the AP getting together and looking through all of the information and making some recommendations. Um, I do have to express some reservations about the uh, proposed sub alternatives that would exempt um, the smaller mesh, uh, particularly in December, and particularly off the coast of New Jersey, where we don't have data. As you heard from staff, uh, the FMAP PDT, you know, their recommendation was to uh, not extend the exemption off Delmarva in December, given the increased uh, interactions with sturgeon during that month. Uh, during that month, uh, and then they also recommended that they that we not extend the exemption off New Jersey. Uh, simply given to the lack of, of data as to whether that message that, uh, you know, the impact of what that would be. And so I have a couple of con or, or concerns or reservations that I want to make sure are on the record. Um, the first, and you, and you heard staff mention this, that uh, whatever the councils adopt uh, this week and next week uh, will serve as the baseline for our analysis under our upcoming biological opinion um, on the fisheries. And that baseline is going to determine whether we're able to, to reach a jeopardy, uh, a non-jeopardy uh, conclusion or whether we're gonna end up 
uh, ultimately reaching a jeopardy of a conclusion, which I don't think anybody wants. And so, you know, and we've talked through the through this development of this action that the more the councils are able to do uh, to reduce interactions with sturgeon in these fisheries through this action uh, increases the, the likelihood that we'll be able to reach a non a jeopardy opinion uh, and increases the likelihood that there won't be any additional measures that are that are required coming out of that process. So any exemption that the councils provide now uh, reduces that that probability it, it increases the, the, the potential for a jeopardy opinion uh, and it increases the potential for uh, for some additional measures. So that's one concern I have, uh, particularly where we don't have data to support uh, off New Jersey to support that the exemption is warranted uh, and would have minimal impact on sturgeon interactions. Uh, you know, even off Del Marva, where we do have uh, some, you know, more data, and we certainly have uh, some, you know, something indicating that the the uh, the uh, the sturgeon rate is, you know, is a third of that um, in the slightly larger mesh, uh, suggesting that maybe the you know the interaction rate is lower. The actual interactions are still non-zero. I mean, there's still 20% of the of the catches. Uh, observed in this area uh, were from small mesh, the, the five inch mesh. So, um, you know, there's there was still expected to see a uh, sturgeon catch. The other, so that's one aspect. The other aspect I want to mention is that, you know, and I don't want to, I hope we haven't lost sight of the fact that this is a Magnuson Act action. So, all of the national standards, including National Standard 9, apply. So, National Standard 9 says that councils when they take action will reduce bycatch to the extent practicable. So, you know, if this motion passes, uh, it will be incumbent on the staff as they're, as they're finalizing the document uh, to demonstrate how these exemptions are practical uh, and how, you know, that we, even with these exemptions, we've reduced bycatch of sturgeon uh, to, that ex to that extent practicable. So I just didn't want people to lose sight of the fact that, you know, on the one hand, we're trying to to accomplish the the provisions that were required in the 2021 biop reduce sturgeon interactions and we're clearly you know expected to do that with these with this action um, but we also have that requirement under under Magnuson Act to reduce bycatch to the extent practicable uh, so I just urge some caution um, I appreciated the the PDT uh, FMAT recommendation I thought that had a lot of merit uh, it was based on the information that we had, uh, based on some uh, on some, some good analysis, uh, and I, as I said, I have some some reservations and concerns about the the uh, proposed motion that would extend those exemptions off New Jersey in, in December. Thank you, Chris Bat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me, Eka? Okay? Yes. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate uh, Mike Pentney's. Um, Comments uh, and, and reservations over the, the this motion. I had the same um, similar uh, reservations uh, on it at the committee level. So I'd like to make a motion to amend that uh, removes language uh, regarding the exemption for New Jersey. Um, I guess it was by sub option five A, but it's not explicitly listed here in the in the motion. And if I get a second, I'll uh, I'll, I'll give uh, uh, my, my rationale for that. Give it a second. Who, who's going to type it up? And, and then second by Mike Pentney. Um, I have typed uh, something in there, so it might just need a refresh.
Would it be? I think Jason think you can try it. Well, either I think Steve. I think I. I can paste it somewhere else um, if the document isn't refreshing. Yeah, it's definitely not refreshing. So, Stephen, um, do you want me to come type it over there, or would it, or should I try to log in to that motions document here? What would be better, Stephen? I just sent the text to Stephen as well. But I won't see it. But well, okay. So you're saying if I log in. <clears throat> Yeah, but I'm not. <clears throat> or maybe I don't. Um, okay. Yeah, I think so. And I think you just sent the. Did you? She was making those changes for back to the motor. I'm not sharing. Which will be. Okay, I think we have it now. This one here. Okay, I think we have it up there now. So, Chris Bassavage, does this reflect your intent here? Yes. Yeah, I think it's 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 more direct. Um, it it's removing the exemption for using mesh less than five and a quarter inches for New Jersey. It keeps it in place for Delmarva. Um, I don't know if it's a a, a substitute or a, a motion to amend. I'm not. I should know that with the, all the Roberts rules training we've had over the years, but. Uh, um, but if, if regardless, I could, yeah, I, I could read this into the record when, when the motion's ready. Yeah, it would be a motion to amend. Yeah, I, I was right. Yeah, did, cool. did, you, did you also mention that, uh, the New Jersey area too, or is this just Delmarva only? So th this, yeah. this is taken care of. This is allowing the, the, uh, the exemption for Delmarva, it's removing New Jersey. Uh, it's it's kind of saying it kind of the, the opposite of how I did. Um, I think it gets it across. So I, I can I, I can read this into the record uh, when, whenever you're ready, Mr. Chair. Yes, please read it into the record. Okay, um, move to amend to adopt alternative five with an exemption for the Delaware, Maryland, Virginia bycatch polygons for the use of gillnet mesh less than five and a quarter inches. Uh, for example, in Delmarva mesh less than five and a quarter inches uh, could 
could do overnight soaks year round. Mesh greater than five and a quarter inches could not do overnight soaks from November from November through March. Um, okay, so uh, and I just got a second. So uh, yeah, yeah, Mike Pentney uh, raised some of the concerns that, that, that I had as far as um, you know what we're trying to accomplish in this action versus what we might have to do uh, uh, in the future, especially when you consider that additional. Uh, action, if needed, could be NIMS led and not council led. And uh, in North Carolina, we've had experience with uh, with ESA you know, regulations coming from ESA and not from the councils regarding you know, bycatch of sea turtles and in, in, in fisheries. And uh, you know, we we don't get a say around the table as far as what those options are, and they don't always work out very well for the for the fisheries. Um, and the other reason for, for removing uh, the New Jersey exemption is uh, some fishermen have claimed that uh, that they can they can fish for spiny dogfish uh, uh, in in New Jersey without leaving the nets overnight. Uh, and the spiny dogfish fishery can can vary depending on where you are along the coast. Where um, you, know, you could do daytime sets and catch uh, catch dogfish in places like New Jersey and in North Carolina. But it doesn't really work in, in Virginia, so there's some uh, kind of location specific uh, uh, nuances with, with with this fishery, and uh, I think I think this is basically kind of um, recognizing uh, the differences between these two areas uh, while still putting in measures to to uh, reduce uh, sturgeon. I don't know if this is going to be enough to um, to satisfy the service, and we certainly don't know if this is going to be. Uh, um, how this is going to impact uh, the next biological opinion with, uh, you know, with with the stock assessment coming up, but uh, I believe this will put us in in uh, kind of better a better position uh, for what's to come down the pike, and I think it also addresses some of the concerns that that Mike Pentney raised. So thanks, Mike Pentney. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate uh, Chris's uh, intervention to to make the motion to amend, which. Which I'm supporting, uh, obviously through my second. Um, I think the New Jersey between the two of them, the New Jersey uh, exemption was the more problematic one, just uh, due to the lack of data to uh, to support it and 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 understand uh, the potential impacts and whether the exemption is warranted. The December issue off Delmarva, uh, you know, I do have some reservations about that, um, but I can understand why we might want to retain that um, uh, at least for now, and and we'll see, uh, you know. Through the, the biological opinion consultation process, we may need to, as Jason said, uh, parse the data in December a little bit further and and see what you know proportion of that catch is coming from the, the smaller mesh versus the, the intermediate and large meshes. Um, but at this time, I can support this as a motion to amend. Thanks. Any further discussion on the motion to amend? Joe Semino. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I appreciate the concerns. It's a resource I'm I'm worried about here. So I think some tough choices need to be made. But I just I think this kind of a little bit flies in the face of how we do bycatch reduction research. I mean, to think that that same research has to be carried out area after area to know that it's it has similar results is is not something we're even capable of doing. And we've made that assumption that it is the same in other areas many times over. So it's a little frustrating. <clears throat> that we're seeing this uh, split, but at the same time, again, my vote's um, going to ultimately have to lean towards the protection of the resource. Any more discussion? Mike Valisi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Joe, to your last point, or were you saying that you would you know, given the protection of the resource being the highest priority, you'd you're, you would stand behind the motion to amend. Would you support that at this time? I just, I'm trying to, the reason I ask you, and I hate to, I, hate, I don't like putting people on the spot. Um, we all get put on the spot often uh, and have to speak for a user, user groups that are often large and have varying degrees of uh, opinions, as we all know. But uh, in this case, just peeling out New Jersey from the original intent from the committee just concerns me that there's a focus on one state that will need to absorb the concern 
um, that the regional office and, and Chris uh, spoke to. Uh, and I just want to see where you stand on this uh, before I make a decision on how to proceed. Thanks. <laughs> well, thanks for the spotlight. <clears throat> I mean, you know, I hope the, the entire council has been following all the work that's gone into this. Uh, I think what we know is that there, there really and truly has been a hot spot in recent years off of New Jersey. And something needs to be done about that. I think the concerns have also been expressed time and again now that this may only be one step in the process. And, and this exemption for if it passes for Delmarva may not be there in just a few years. You know, we may not be far enough along the lines between the next buy-up and the next um, assessment. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to support the motion, but who knows if this is the end of the story. Any more discussion on the motion? All right, I'm going to go ahead and read this to make sure we got all the language right and people online can hear it and all. Uh, of course, we have the motion to amend to adopt alternative five with an exemption for Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, bycatch polygons for the use of gill net mesh less than five and a quarter inches, e.g., in Delmarva mesh less than five and a quarter mesh could do overnight soaks year round. Mesh greater or equal to five and a quarter could not do overnight soaks from November through March. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand on the computer. Yeah, if you don't have a computer on, just raise your hand. I saw 18 um, on the computer. I'm not sure if there are hands also in, yep. in the room. Yeah, we have 18 with raised hand. Rich Wong also here at the meeting has raised his hand. So that's 19 in favor. Everybody, please lower your hands. Any objections? I see one objection. And that's 19 and 1 to me is 21, so that's it. So the motion passes 19 to 1 with zero exemptions. Now, the, this now becomes our main motion. And as Jason gets this up, I think. So, Stephen, I slid down on my screen so that. This is my screen, right? So it should it should pop down. Maybe I'll stop and reshare, see if that does it. like it's trying to catch up. There we go. Um, 
All right, now we're going to go back to our motion move to adopt alternative five with the exemption of Delaware, Maryland, Virginia bycatch polygons for the use of the gill net mesh less than five and a quarter inches, e.g., in Delmarva, mesh less than five and a quarter inches mesh do not mesh could do overnight soaks year round. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. Mesh five and a quarter. Yeah. Can we take out that second mesh, I guess, past the, the less than five and a quarter? Yeah. Mesh less than five and a quarter could do overnight soaks year round. Mesh greater or equal to five and a quarter inches could not do overnight soaks from November through March. Any further discussion on the motion? Adam? Yeah, thank you. So as the sole objector on the last motion, it was just my intent to remain consistent with how I had voted at the committee uh, in light of not having, I mean, the issues that were raised were raised at the committee anyway. Um, but yeah, nothing really changed at my since then. Um, however, given the overwhelming majority of that vote, it is my intent at this time to vote in favor of this motion. Thank you. Are there any objections? Are there any any more? Let me ask one more. Any uh, more conversation on the motion? Any pub, anyone from the public? Jason. Um, and again, I think just I think it might be useful just to reflect on the verbal record at least. Carson, could you summarize? So this kind of highlights the exception. Um, Carson, could you? Quickly summarize what alternative five would would lead to as a prohibition. Then that's not explicit in this motion. It's in the document. It's clear, but I think it still could be just good verbally to reiterate what alternative five is. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, alternative five is an overnight soak prohibition for New Jersey for May and November. And for the Delmarva region polygons, an overnight soak prohibition for November through March. And then this um, exempt, small mesh exemption is sub alternative 5B, <clears throat> which is only for the Delmarva region. Vessels using less than five and a quarter inch gill net mesh would be exempted from soak prohibition under alternative 5. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion? Any abstentions to the motion? Motion passes by unanimous consent. Thank you to the Dogfish Committee. Let us go on now to move to the Monkfish. I believe we have a motion ready from the Monkfish Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. On behalf of the Monkfish Committee, uh, move to adopt alternative five year round low profile gear requirement in New Jersey bycatch hotspot polygon as the preferred alternative. Is this a committee motion? There is not going to be a second, it is not needed. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, the committee motion now becomes the main motion. And we will need a first and second for that, please. No, we don't. Yeah, yeah. No more, no, any further discussion on the motion? All right, with that, that one's very easy. All right. Are there any 
since it's already been read into the minutes. Is there any objection to the motion? Any abstentions to the motion? Seeing none, the motion passes by unanimous consent. Peter Hughes. So I do have another motion. Uh, this came out as a consensus statement from the committee. And it reads, move to write a letter to NOAA NEFSC Observer Program to develop and implement a carcass tagging program for dead sturgeon discards, similar to sea turtles and marine mammals as well as including a tagging program for live sturgeon discards. This would apply to any fishery where sturgeon are caught regardless of gear type, area, et cetera. Peter, would this be a joint letter or just Mid-Atlantic Council? I'm gonna to look to my left and see if that motion will probably be made up in New England also. Well, it's a motion that came from the committee, so I'm assuming it will be made in New England as well. So whether you get one letter or two letters, I think it's just a semantics at this point. Okay. Discussion on the motion? Joe Gris. Oh. Yeah, it's a committee motion. We don't need one. Any discussion on the motion? Any discussion, any public comment? Seeing none, this now becomes the motion before us. Are there any objections to the motion? Any abstentions to the motion? One abstention. Motion passes with one abstention. Peter, you want to make a last motion? Yep, one more last one. Move to submit this framework with identification of the preferred alternatives to NOAA fisheries after the New England Fishery Management Council takes final action. I think that does require a second. Joe Gress. Peter, would you like to add any rationale? Um, it, <laughs> well, we, we need to get this done. We're on a very tight timeline, so it needs to be submitted to National Marine Fisheries Service as soon as possible. Yo. Ditto. <laughs> All right, any discussion on the motion? Any objections to the motion? Any abstentions to the motion? One abstention. Motion, motion passes unanimously with one abstention. Carson, is there anything else you need to bring before us? Um, nope, we are all set. Thank you and apologies for that technical issue. Alrighty, thank you very much. With that, let's, um, let's take a 15 minute break. We're gonna come back at, oh, Jason, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to the NIMS EPSD folks who were not on the FMAP, but kind of stepped in um, through, I think, ultimately the help of CAMS and having CAMS set up and running pretty good now, um, really helped out with some of those um, revenue analyses by area that would have been, I think, really sticky to do in this timeline if they hadn't have jumped in and if CAMS hadn't been up and running to like, facilitate that. So um, 
So I know there have been like some struggles with CAMs, but I think this is an instance where having that set up really facilitated some kind of rapid turnaround on, on analyses to help this uh, move forward. All right, thank you, Jason. With that, let's take, uh, well, let's come back at 1030. We'll see everybody at 1030 and we'll do the in-depth progress report.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Let's do our next agenda item, the NTAP progress report for industry-based survey pilot program. Anna Hart, council staff, whenever you're ready. All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so although the main point of today is to discuss the um, NTAP's discussion on the industry-based survey pilot project, um, I wanted to take this opportunity to also discuss um, our recent meetings and some of those updates as well. Um, so over the next couple slides, I'm going to go over some other topics first, including um, the Science Center update provided at the February 8th NTAP meeting, um, some survey redesign and mitigation efforts, and an update on the restrictor rope research, and then some research topics that the group came up with. Um, so diving into the center's update, uh, the center informed NTAP that OMAO, which is NOAA's Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, uh, does not have a current policy regarding transiting and surveying in wind farms. Um, it was also relayed that there is enough funding to support NTAP for another two years. Um, they also provided an update on PMAD. So PMAD is the Science Center's Populations and Ecosystems Monitoring and Analysis Division. Um, it underwent a reorganization um, and in, uh, inclusion of a new offshore wind ecology branch. Um, and in the NTAP meeting summary, there's a copy of the new organization report for reference. Um, the center also provided an update on the different surveys. Um, this fall, there was high completion rate for both the Bigelow and NEMAP, and toes missed were due to poor weather and fixed gear issues. Um, the fall bottom long line survey hit the 10 year milestone um, and that data it, um, has recently been included in a couple of New England stock assessments, um, including Atlantic cod, a few skate species and red hake. Um, there was also a productive NEMAP and CMAP trawl vessel calibration workshop a few months ago. Um, and from this workshop, the group is planning to develop um, a best practice guide for gear and vessel calibration across these two surveys. Um, there has also been a few recent uh, center updates floating around via email related to the spring bottom trawl survey, um, which looks like it's uh, going well so far. Um, and I believe there's only been a single weather disruption um, at the second leg, which I believe is still currently underway. Um, so the NTAP also got an update on several survey redesign and mitigation efforts, and I'm just going to quickly highlight those over the next couple slides. Um, but if you're interested in more information, there is uh, much more detail in that February 8th meeting summary. And then there's copies of all the um, individual presentations on the NTAP meeting page. Um, so the, for the first um, project, um, the group got an update on an evaluation of alternative statistical sampling designs uh, for the uh, Northeast Fisheries Science Center bottom trawl survey. Um, through this effort, the center is exploring two approaches including reducing the number of strata by condensing existing strata into superstrata, as well as using a spatially balanced sampling design that is more adaptable to changes. Um, and the figure on the right here um, just shows an example of how that strata can be condensed. Uh, the next uh, update the group got was on the Survey Simulation Experimentation and Evaluation Project, or SEEP. Um, the goal of this project is to test if um, the likely changes of effort reduction associated with offshore wind could be quantified, um, and it aims to better understand if supplemental sampling uh, is done, what approach might be better than others. Um, and the figure on the right shows the modeling simulation framework um, and the layered approach they are taking to the modeling. Uh, the third effort discussed was the federal survey mitigation strategy um, that includes developing survey specific mitigation plans for 19 federal surveys that will be affected by offshore wind. Um, this includes both the bottom trawl survey as well as the bottom long line survey. Um, these are currently going through an internal development and review, but there are plans for an external review that involves a peer review panel made up of SSC members from both councils as well as representation from the commission. Um, and the map on the right just shows the overlap of the bottom trawl survey sampling area and the current offshore wind lease and planning areas. And then lastly, NTAP received an update on the pilot hook and line survey. Um, given the development of offshore wind, um, it's going to be difficult to 
um, conduct the surveys um, utilizing toad gear. And so the service is piloting this hook and line survey, which includes gear that can be safely deployed in any habitat and in close proximity to the offshore wind turbines. And through this pilot, the center is trying to identify if this type of survey is worth the resources um, it would take to fully develop a long-term survey and to also inform how close to the turbines can actually be sampled. Um, and the map on the right shows the planned survey areas for the pilot. Um, there was also an update on the restrictor rope research, as I mentioned, um, some results, conclusions, and next steps. Um, just to highlight a few key conclusions, um, it was noted that um, the that they observed limited impacts uh, of the restrictor rope on catch, um, and that it would be worth considering uh, the positive impacts the restrictor rope had um, on standardizing gear performance when developing um, new surveys, especially surveys in wind energy areas. Um, the group also discussed one caveat with the research being that there's not enough data to say for certain that the restrictor rope had no effect on any of the species, um, but there was some confidence based on the diversity of the species caught and sampled through this um, limited research effort. Um, for some next steps, um, NTAP members and researchers involved in this study are working to uh, publish this paper in a peer-reviewed art, art journal. Um, the work was also presented at the World Fisheries Congress in Seattle, as well as at ROSA's advisory council meeting last month, um, and it will be presented at a future council meeting. And then moving forward, the group is just looking for recommendations on usage or potential expansion of this research project. Um, the NTAP also had a brainstorming session to come up with uh, new research ideas for funding, um, if, or research ideas if funding um, for such opportunities became available. Um, and some of the main ideas included expanding that restrictor rope research into the Gulf of Maine, um, expanding MEMAP. Uh, into deeper water to have more overlap with the Bigelow, um, developing survey techniques for floating wind energy areas, um, and some ideas suggested including uh, acoustics, eDNA, and short string bottom long lines. Um, there was recommendations for calibration and standardization across the different wind survey and monitoring programs. And then lastly, there were suggestions of doing a perimeter sampling study in areas that will not be able to be surveyed in the future. So for example, a before after gradient type of study. Um, so a lot of the conversation at the NTAP meeting was surrounded about uh, wind um, and some of these research ideas weren't um, like the typical ones, uh, which are usually focused on um, Bigelow survey efficiencies. Um, so now moving to the Bigelow Contingency Plan and industry-based survey updates. Um, so since both NTAP and the NTAP Working Group had the opportunity to discuss these topics, uh, the next few slides uh, combines the information um, and the discussion at both of those meetings. So just a reminder, there are four options being discussed for future Bigelow Contingency Plans. Um, the first is the option to use the Pisces, and just a reminder, the Pisces is the Bigelow sister ship used in the south. Uh, the second option is using a different science center vessel that would be calibrated to the Bigelow. The third is the idea of using an industry vessel that is calibrated to the Bigelow. And lastly, the idea, uh, this idea of an industry-based survey that is not calibrated to the Bigelow and serves as a parallel separate survey. Um, and I'd like to note that these contingency plans is for when the Bigelow is not available on short notice. Um, and this plan does not reflect the alternative for when the Bigelow is offline for the vessel midlife repairs. Um, the midlife repairs um, are planned for September uh, 2027 through September 2028. And for that time, it has already been determined that the Pisces will fill in. Um, so a quick update on each of these options. So the Pisces uh, readiness plan has been drafted and is being refined by NIMS and OMAO. Uh, the South e Southeast Fisheries Science Center has agreed that the Pisces can be the primary backup to the Bigelow. Um, and some next steps uh, for this option include developing a specific plan and funding for vessel improvements, discussing when to trigger the Pisces, and discussions of um, if there is a need to calibrate the Pisces to the Bigelow. 
uh, for this option, NTAP did express concern related to the time it would take to get the Pisces ready for trawling, as well as the time it would take to move the Pisces from its home port in Mississippi to the Northeast in such short notice. Uh, for contingency plan option two, there was a uh, proposal provided to the Northeast Fishery Science Center director related to this option and is being discussed by NIMPS headquarters. Um, at the meeting, NTAP meetings, it was noted that an opti optimistic time frame to acquire a new federal vessel would be at least a year, if not longer. Um, and then there has been no progress on option three. And NTAP members noted that um, there would be very few commercial vessels that would even fit the bill for this option. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot I had uh, animations. Anyways, um, so uh, there'd be very few vessels that would even fit this bill. Um, and so there's been no progress made on it. Um, so for option four, uh, again, this is that industry-based survey that would be uh, not calibrated to the Bigelow and would serve as a parallel separate survey. Uh, just a reminder some, on some recent council discussions. So back in October, the council requested the Science Center produce a white paper that would further develop this parallel industry survey. That white paper was submitted and presented to the council in February of this year. Um, and following that presentation, the council passed another motion tasking NTAP and the NTAP working group to design a pilot project that would test the viability of this type of survey. Um, and similar motions were made both in New England as well as at the commission. So based on the February 2024 council motion, uh, both NTAP and then NTAP working group met to discuss this pilot project. And both of these meetings resulted in, in much discussion. And there was a number of recommendations as a result of these discussions. Um, so first, the group discussed the need for the survey to operate in wind farms and for the pilot to be designed to test the operability of the different size vessels in wind farms. Um, however, there was not clear consensus on this, and some instead felt like current monitoring and commercial activities will eventually inform what type of gear and vessels will be able to operate um, there, and so that this shouldn't be a focus of this pilot or survey. Um, second, uh, NTAP and the working group members also felt the survey uh, should sample the same strata as the Bigelow, but they recommended a truncated depth. Uh, specifically, they recommended a maximum depth of, of about 130 to 150 fathom, or a depth range that would meet the different stock assessment needs. Um, they also recommended that the survey occur in multiple regions, um, and they specifically recommended the Gulf of Maine, Georgia's Bank, Southern New England, and the Mid-Atlantic. And they expressed that the pilot doesn't have to occur in each area at the same, oh, uh, sorry. And they uh, recommended that the pilot cover at least three areas, um, mainly for proof of concept. But they expressed that the pilot doesn't have to occur in each of these, these areas at the same time, and the vessels could likely share the same gear, at least for the pilot. Uh, the group also discussed 12 hours versus 24 hour sampling periods. Some noted that 24 hour sampling on a single vessel will significantly reduce the number of capable industry vessels. And for this, uh, there was a preference for using similar paired vessels operating 12 hour days over a 24 hour time period. Um, so one, basically one vessel would have a noon to midnight shift and another vessel would have a midnight to noon shift. So you're still covering that 24 hours, but two vessels are, are doing the work. Um, and then for gear type, uh, the gear recommended using um, the same trawl gear as the Bigelow, uh, specifically the same net as well as sweep, but they felt um, same doors was not necessary. Uh, they also recommended using the restrictor rope. Uh, they felt like given the positive results, the restrictor rope uh, had on net geometry and performance that it would be good, especially if the survey uses multiple vessels. Uh, they recommended not using an otter trawl. Um, and then they expressed desire for using um, similar net men mensuration and electronics that industry vessels are already using. But they did note the need to further look into this. Um, and I'll go over that on uh, an upcoming slide. And then lastly, they recommended collecting CTD, plankton, as well as acoustic data 
they felt that you know sampling everything in the pilot uh, would be a good idea and then it would also help rule out what is feasible versus what is not. All right, so a couple more recommendations. So given the number of questions raised during the meeting related to portable sampling workstations and the different sampling equipment uh, that may be needed, as well as electronics, the group recommended hosting a follow-up meeting with scientists that work on um, different regional surveys to really scope out costs, needs, and ideas for this type of equipment. Um, the group also recommended hosting a workshop with interested vessel owners and operators to discuss the pilot survey in more detail. They recommended doing something similar to what was done in the pilot hook and line survey uh, during that planning process, um, which included discussions with industry on sampling area, equipment, vessel needs, and more. Um, and then during the meeting, there were also a number of elements that NTAP and the NTAP working group felt needed some further discussion and exploration. Um, one big question the group had was who will manage the pilot project development and implementation? Uh, will it be the Science Center? And if so, it was noted that that would require resources for staff as well as administrative support, or will it be a third party similar to how NEMAP is man managed? Um, and they noted that if this is the case, we need to identify who that third party is um, and that it would likely still require some level of science center resources. Um, there was also a number of questions about the space um, and electronics required both on the vessel as well as for the sampling workstations. So these are the workstations the science uh, would, would the scientists would be sampling and, and doing their work up in. Um, and that led to a rec the recommendation on the previous slide to host that regional survey staff um, uh, follow-up meeting. Uh, there was also discussion about the different net mensuration and other electronic equipment, and if there may be any data man management implications if um, the same equipment brands and types aren't used across all the different vessels. And so the NTAP working group wanted to have a follow-up meeting to really dive into this detail a bit more. Um, and then there was also a question about who will manage, process, and um, analyze the data and the samples and, and house the samples as well. All right, so a couple additional things that the group felt needs to be refined. Uh, they felt that they, uh, to refine some of the survey elements as well, like wire scope, tow speed, and duration. They felt like more conversation was needed. Um, during the meeting, there was also some discussion on how much the survey would cost. Uh, they estimated it would be in the one to two million uh, range based on knowledge of other surveys, but a more flushed out cost estimate would be needed. Um, and then the working group also felt like additional conversations were needed to discuss and review the statistical design, uh, specifically the shallower depth range, timing of the survey, um, if there would be interest or need in overlap of um, this survey with NEMAP, and then overall adaptability of the survey for future loss in survey areas. Um, and they specifically mentioned the area of, in Gulf of Maine that is um, currently planned for some floating wind uh, uh, turbines. Um, so for next steps, we are planning to have a follow-up NTAP working group meeting to continue this pilot project discussion and to work through some of those to be determined topics. And we are hoping to have um, the next meeting early next month, so early May. Um, so that concludes the presentation. Um, before I go to questions, um, just quick shout out to Catherine Ford and the NTAP co-chairs, so Mr. Chair and Dan Salerno. With that, that concludes the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Hannah. Any questions or comments for Hannah? Michelle DeVoe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Hannah, for the for the update and the impressive amount of work that um, this group has been doing, for sure. I guess I was curious to, um, the, that there's not, that the group is waiting on um, guidance from OMAO, OMAO on um, 
transiting and survey operations within offshore wind farms? Because I feel like we'd heard in the past that, um, at least verbally, it's been conveyed that, um, you know, the NOAA white ships would not be able to survey within offshore wind farms once they're built out. And so, you know, that's the impetus for the federal survey mitigation strategy and all of those other requirements. And at maybe just some clarification on, on that, if that's just been like a verbal thing thus far and OMAO is developing guidance or what? Um, so the, the current stance is that operating or transiting through wind farms is at the commanding officer's discretion. Um, and then most people who have worked on NOAA vessels know that a commanding officer will not do um, operations within a nautical mile of something else in the water. Um, so you put those two together and the probability of doing operations in wind energy areas is low to none. Um, but we have asked OMAO to develop a formal policy on operating and transiting through wind energy developments, and that is in process. Anything, any other comments? Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Hart. And what Dr. Duvall said is 100% true. You put in a tremendous amount of work, you and Ms. Ford and the, the two co-chairs have done a lot of work on this topic. Um, when it comes to funding, I mean, it really depends a lot on what the Science Center is going to require as far as things like electronics, which are expensive. They get expensive in a big hurry. And, and I'm not thinking one to two million dollars is the right number. I'm thinking three million dollars is the right number. Just that's where I'm coming from. But um, apparently there is a little bit of an issue with funding already uh, in the president's draft budget. I think it's pages 296 to 298. There is a discussion about removing funding for cooperative research. Uh, Dr. Hare could probably describe it better than me, but that's a little hiccup we should all be aware of. You know, the council really can't do anything about it unless somebody asks us to comment on it. But uh, if in fact that shortfall is under consideration, then I would, you know, ask all of us to do your personal best to talk to your Congress people and make sure that shortfall does not occur. So, uh, Dr. Hare, if you want to add to that, that would be great. Yeah, but I can just add some clarity. Um, the president's budget, um, again, is based on competing priorities. Um, and it did request a cut to the cooperative research budget line, sort of the NOAA Fisheries cooperative research budget line. Um, and it's about a 75% cut. Um, the, obviously, the president's budget needs to go through all the steps and congressional approval, so it is just a proposal. Um, you know, from a, it also identifies the cooperative research program at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center um, for the reductions. Um, and uh, has a you know tells us to plan to transition staff um, to other funding lines and to specifically end the study fleet program. Um, so we're looking at it you know from a Northeast Fisheries Science Center perspective, from a NOAA Fisheries perspective. You know that's the cooperative research budget line. Um, it does not uh, decrease our commitment to cooperative research. Um, so we're going to, you know, if that budget were to come to be enacted, um, we would need to figure out other funding lines to move our cooperative research activities to. Um, but, you know, just to reiterate, we remain committed to cooperative research um, and we'll do what we can to keep activities like the industry based trawl survey um, or study fleet um, ongoing because we know they're the importance to the science in the region. Joe Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Hannah, for what you presented. Um, more of a comment, uh, just I was afforded the ability to sit in on the NTAP meeting after the last council meeting and, and listen in, and actually got to spend a good part of the day with the industry members on the panel and also went to lunch with them and listening to them. Um, and if anyone on council hasn't done that yet, please take that opportunity. There's these captains that are on this panel 
wealth of knowledge. Um, definitely dedicated to what we're trying to do. Have some great ideas on how we might be able to supplement survey work in the light of the budgetary issues that we're facing. Albatross needs to read that. ICs, we don't know, you know, what's going to happen there. You know, there's a lot of challenges facing us on top of all the other challenges piling on for our surveys. Um, and I just want to, you know, admiration for that panel. It was a very informative day. I'm glad I stayed back in D.C. for the day and fought the traffic home to listen in to these guys because um, it, it's beneficial. Anything we can do to support any ideas they have, we need to try and do it. Um, they've got great ideas going forward because it looks, sounds like from the service side of things, it's in flux. We don't really know if there's a guarantee of what's going to happen in the future there, be it with the vessels or with anything else. Um, we need the commercial side ideas to help keep something going on the science or we're going to have nothing in a couple of years. That is a risk that could happen. Um, especially with all the budget fights that continue these days um, and the different priorities that, you know, Congress has. So that's just a comment. Any more comments? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Hannah. And like I say, the cooperative research thing, losing money is a scary thought. It really is. All right, with that, I guess uh, our morning agenda is done. We're going to take a long lunch. Uh, so plan on being back here at 1 o'clock, Peter Hughes. I'll say for lunch, uh, the uh, White House hoagie shop is excellent. You can walk to it. Um, there's also a place in town that's old Atlantic City called Tony's Baltimore Grill. You can go sit down. It's, uh, you know, that's a place that's 24-7, 365 days out of the year. Um, they're really cool, cool places. So that one you have to drive to, the other one you can walk to. There's stuff around here, but I couldn't tell you what's at, at the uh, at the little shopping center place here. All right, see y'all at one o'clock.